Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Aram. Today I'm going to break down how to row a 1k, how to row a 2k, what it means for the body, and what are the different strategies that explosive athletes and endurance athletes should adhere to in order to be successful. So welcome to today's video. There are differences between explosive and endurance athletes. If you want to know what an explosive, what an endurance athlete is, let me explain in a few basic words, and I will also link to a video to find the difference. An explosive athlete likes to do hard, short bursts, but hates long stuff. So long intervals. Endurance athletes are exactly the opposite. They hate short bursts, and they love the long stuff. If you're somewhere in the middle, ideal. Rowing needs exactly the balance point. Most people are not balanced. This is why there's no talent in rowing, only work. So talent in rowing means work. Now, I've started to prepare a little drawing here, how to strategize as an explosive athlete. And then I will make a little drawing how to strategize as an endurance athlete. And then I will talk about what it actually, how you should strategize no matter what type of athlete you are when it comes to the start. So as an explosive athlete, it's very important not to overpace for the first half of the race. The first half is that's something that is not too rigid. It can be the first 800 or it can be the first 1200. So um, the less your endurance capacity is, um, the later I would start with winding up the pace. Though the greater your endurance capacity is, the earlier I would start with doing this. So I, I'm an explosive athlete the way I always did it. Um, I was pretty conservative for the, ace, for the first 800. And right when I knew that most people were suffering the most, myself included, um, I started to wind it up right there. I tried to bring my split time down by a second. So I would do this at about the 800 because I knew that I could kill myself over the first 500, so I had to be conservative. And I would force myself not to go over pace. And the next time I would bring my 500 meter split down by one or two seconds, would be just after the 1,000 meter mark, so at about a 1,200 meter mark. Then at the 1,500, I would try, if possible, to drop by another second. And for the last 300, this would be where I would give it everything I've got. So that was only straightforward finish line. Whatever happens here happens here, and I didn't really matter. It didn't really matter to me if I failed or not. So that strategy helped me as an explosive athlete to be not to overpace. So I've made the mistake to overpace like many others do as well. Um, I simply wasn't the right athlete for that. Um, I will talk about common myths and, and things that people get wrong, in my opinion, at the end of the video. Yeah, I know most race courses actually do it backwards. So the start will be 2K because there's still 2K to go. Um, I see the other way around, so zero meters already completed, 500 meters already completed, 1,000 completed. I see from an athlete's perspective. If you're the classic endurance athlete, it's very difficult for you to overpace. It, it's still possible. This is what rowing is like. You can actually look at your target time, then you divide it by four. It's that simple. It's a super simple example. Let's say you want to do eight minutes. And the way it works is that you try to be at a two minute split cons consistently it may be a 158 for the last 500. An, an explosive athlete couldn't do that, a, a classic explosive athlete. So an explosive athlete who would try to go for an eight minute, they would probably do a 202, a 202, 200, and a staggering last 500. They would end up with the same time. If you asked an explosive athlete to do the same thing that I asked from an endurance athlete, it wouldn't work. The overall time at the end would be slower. And that's important to understand. Okay, so give you a rough estimate. Let's say I asked the explosive athlete to do a 202, a 202 split. Um, let's say we have a 158 split here that compensates for the first 500. And then we have another 158 or maybe even a 156. So you end up with a 758 here. And you end up with a 7.58 here as well. So an endurance athlete has very similar ways of... So an endurance athlete kind of keeps the same pace for most of the race. And maybe 
there's a little bit of a hot phase over the last 500. An endurance athlete is not necessarily, uh, doesn't necessarily have an advantage because the, the sprint capacity to the line is usually not that great. You need wall power to sprint, and this is where explosive athletes um, have all their advantages. So if an explosive athlete is able to drop the pace to 202 and 200 and 158, and then maybe 150, this is a, what a classic explosive athlete's race looks like, that person will win. Now, if an endurance athlete tried to do this, um, they probably could do, let's say they went to a uh, 158, 158, 158, they would maybe do a 156. There's no capacity to go, to go for a 150. That's important to understand. You cannot ask a typical endurance athlete to be explosive just because you want it. Whatever an endurance athlete has to do way more calculation for the entire race. An explosive athlete has to, just has to make sure that she or he survives the first 1200 <laughs> and, and doesn't, doesn't trail behind too much. But we've seen races where boats trail behind somewhat for the first seven, 800. I remind you of the uh, Kiwi double. They were probably typical explosive athletes. This was probably their strength. This is how they broke. So myth number one, a fast start brings a psychological advantage. Um, no, <laughs> that, that may be true for kids racing, but it's definitely not true to hire your kid up. If your motivation is so bad that if you're behind two boat links, you lose all your fighting spirit, it's not very likely you belong to the group of successful rowers in, in any age category. That's simply how to, what the reality is like. Uh, you have to be able to fight no matter if you're 10 lengths behind or one length in, in the lead. It's always the same game. And a fast start does the following thing. If you overpace at the start, um, you get into anaerobic threshold state way too early, and that changes your, your energy yield. So I've explained this in, in a different video in more details. And if you want, I can do another video, explain that in more and more details. But just as a quick synopsis, if your body starts to be in anaerobic state too early in a race, the energy yield, so glucose to ATP, which is the only source of energy the muscle can use, drops from 32 to two. That's quite a loss of energy. <clears throat> and on top of that, you accumulate a lot of lactate in the body that the body cannot reuse because it can only reuse lactate uh, when it's in aerobic state. So there's a lot of disadvantages to that. In a rowing race, it is utopious that you will be in aerobic state all the way. So in an ideal world, and I'm, I mean, this is, yeah, it is just an ideal world. You would probably be in aerobic state up to the 600 meter mark. Then you would be, then, then you're, there are some coaches who say, well, you should be in a rubbing state up to the 1,000 meter mark. I would love to have see this being true, but I'm not sure if that's it, if that can hold true. Maybe for super endurance athletes who have an extremely high anaerobic threshold capacity, so it means they can pull a lot of watts without being anaerobic. That is possible. Um, I had under 23 athletes, lightweight athletes. Um, they could do 300, 300. 60, 70 watts. Um, my highest anaerobic thresholds was 383 watts for minimal and a 23 lightweight. That is possible. Between 500 and 800, you will reach anaerobic state. So then there's that phase where you build up uh, lactate, but still at an at a almost linear pace. So that is still manageable. And the question is, it, it largely depends on your state of training. Question is how long that phase goes. Uh, the better trained you are, and that's true for endurance and explosive health. The better trained you are, the later your curve changes. So let me explain what I mean by curve. This is becoming scientific here, but this is, you know, rowing has a lot to do with science. These are millimole of lactate. These are the watts. Watts, lactate. And let's say this is our anaerobic threshold state. Let's just call it four millimole which is not true for most people, but it's an average. Most of the time it works somehow. Let's say you start with low watts, your lactate levels just grow linear. And all of a sudden, when you hit a certain watt level, let's say this is 350, that curve goes up exponentially. So it's not, it's not always linear. Uh, you see this when you do lactate tests. So 
when, when the body turns into full uh, anaerobic mode, it goes into full anaerobic mode, um, lactate accumulates rapidly, progressively. This is so fast. And the question is, when does it happen? So usually it happens between, um, with well-trained athletes, between 800 and, and 1400. Then we've got the phase three, which is the tough one. How much lactate can you endure? Now it's simply enduring agony. And this is why we do high intensity training. So now you understand why we need both. We need endurance capacity. This is the reason why I have 11 different training zones. And this is the reason why I focus a lot on just basic aerobic capacity. So massive aerobic base without this being boring. But the most important thing is that you understand that my goal is to make sure you, you get into anaerobic threshold state as late as possible. And that that curve goes goes linear and starts to, to go up exponentially as late as possible so that you have more energy available for the race, that you get into a high lactate state as late as possible. And then this is why we do high intensity stuff. Then you're better able than other people to cope with high lactate states. This is why we do the high intensity stuff. That's my philosophy of training. Rowing has a lot to do with, with endurance planning, especially because there is so much strength involved. Uh, that makes it more difficult than playing for cyclists, for example. In, in cycling, it's, it's everything involves around endurance. Strength is not such an issue. So a fast start brings you a psychological advantage. Is this true or not? No, it's not true. Ultimately, time counts. If you're fast, you're fast. There's nothing you can change about this. And if you're not motivated enough to beat somebody's butt just because that person is uh, two links ahead of you, tough luck. You know, if an endurance, if, if we compare the two races, let's say explosive versus endurance, the explosive athlete would be four seconds behind at the 1,000 meter mark. They still would be two seconds behind at the 1,500 meter mark. At the finish, it would be even. Whatever your race is, you have to figure out what's the time to beat. And it doesn't really matter if somebody is uh, three lengths ahead of you at the start. And interestingly, I found that if you look at most of the, the elite level racing, you find that very, in very, very, very few times, the boat that is leading at the 200 meter mark or 250 meter mark is actually winning. And it doesn't count who's at the 250, who's ahead at the 250. What counts is who's ahead at the 2K, who's ahead, or talking about masters racing at the 1K. This is what counts. A fast start has a massive negative side effect. It gets you into anaerobic state very early. So what happens is that you get into high anaerobic state here. You cannot reuse the lactate and boom, your curve goes up. And that would probably happen at the 400. And this is why you see early leaders break away. And there is no recovery in, in a highly competitive field over the course of the race. That's just utopias. Be conservative with your energy according to your type of physiology. Fast start brings a psychological advantage. As a matter of fact, it brings more physiological disadvantage than any psychological advantage could get you. hard strokes within a race does it make sense no what happens is and talk about lactate this game we have let's say you're right there and they say okay 10 hard strokes what you do is you essentially do this <laughs> so you try to change the pace and there's another disadvantage to that changing speed of a boat is very energy consuming. Maintaining speed of a boat is not as energy consuming. If you change the speed, change it and hold it. Changing speed just to drop again to get a psychological advantage doesn't really work. I know there are races where this works exactly so, but these are usually not professional fields. If we talk about professional fields, and this is also true for junior master rowing, ultimately what counts is the time you have at the finish line. And ultimately what counts is how, how conservative are you with your energy, with the energy spendings. So 10 hard strokes within a race gets you into high lactate states too early. Major downside, and it costs too much energy to accelerate, decelerate, accelerate, decelerate. So 10 hard strokes, take it easy. <laughs> Whenever I see boats next to me doing 10 hard strokes, I just count. Count the 10 strokes, then give it another 15, then you wait until they die off, and then you pass. Just increasing your pace maybe about one split second or so that's enough
All right, ladies and gents, to sum this entire thing up, let me recap the most important things of a 1K and a 2K race. So how important is the start? It's essential to get you into the game, but it's not essential to win the race. That's my humble opinion. Uh, a 300 meter sprint is something different. So if we look at German um, Udo Bundesliga, for example, that's all about starting. <laughs> it's, it's brutal force and power. But a 1K race, uh, 2K race is, is quite something different. The start is there to help you to get into the game quickly but it's not there to try to get a lead or psychological advantage. A start is there to get up to get up to speed. You may actually go over pace for five to ten strokes. That's all right, but not with the intention to to get a lead. It's just to get up to speed. The goal is that you have a certain pace for the first 500. That is your target pace, and of course, because you start from a standstill, you may have to go a little faster, but you automatically will because you're nervous. But one of the best starts I've seen is from the Kiwi 8 during practice. And that start shows it all. It's so relaxed, it's so composed, but trust me, by stroke number 20, they are at incredible speed. And that's how I, reg I, I recommend everybody does a start. Composed, solid, relaxed, focused, and the quickness and the speed develops. It takes time. And then, pace the race as it suits you and it suits your personality and your body type. So if you're clearly endurance, structure the race evenly. If you're clearly explosive athlete, brace yourself for the first half and then gradually wind it up or go all out crazy for the second half, depending on your training background and how fit you are. Um, it, it's pretty much the same for, for a 1K. A 5K has a bit of a different structure, but if you're interested, I can happily do a 5K. Um, a long distance strategy video as well. Just let me know in the comments. Good. And no mid sprints, uh, no mid race sprints doesn't pay at all. And that's about it. Should you do a final sprint? Of course. At the end, everything everything counts. And if you're capable of doing so, the earlier the better. What counts, remember, is not the stroke rate. What counts is the boat speed. Ladies and gents, with this being said, I hope this video was interesting for you. If you want to work with me, go to armtraining.com. Leave a like, subscribe. Always looking forward to the comments. I actually read them all. I may not get around to answer them all, but I read them all. And I enjoy, I thoroughly enjoy your input. Discuss, uh, discuss this topic with me on rowing.zone. That's a rowing enthusiast platform. I checked yesterday, almost 1,000 members now. It's become pretty large. It's a community platform for rowing enthusiasts, on water rowing, indoor rowing, coastal rowing, hobby rowing. It's all about rowing. Alrighty. Thank you so much. If you want to see this video ad free and many others, go to ardentrading.com. There's something called the member area platform. You pay a couple euros a month or a couple bucks a month and you get to see all these videos plus all these Saturday live recordings if you're not part of that team and you get to see everything ad free. All right. Have a good one. See you in the next video. Bye-bye. Oh, share the video. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye.